Wonderful. Um, hello, everyone. It's, uh, it's good to see everybody in person. Uh, I'd like to call the meeting to order at 3 o'clock uh, today for the Finance Committee. Um, and I think the order of business is I need to do a roll call. So I will do that. I'm here. Uh, Lucy? Neil? Here. And Stephen Cassani? Here. Kenneth Levine? Here. Jason Pressman? Be absent today, Michelle Kahn, and Bill Urban. Here. All right. Very good. Um, now I think we'll advance to uh, oral communications. Um, yes, in the back. Here. Yes. Yeah, and for those um, who can't hear who are online, uh, the questions about whether the meetings are being recorded. This one certainly is, it shows recording. And I have seen a prior meeting of ours posted to YouTube at the Portola Valley site on YouTube. I just happened to stumble across it. So mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming they're being recorded and that's the policy. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm constitutionally unable to watch myself uh, do anything. So I recoiled in horror as soon as I saw it. So I didn't notice which meeting it was, but I, I thought it was the last one. But I could be wrong. Um, I had something not on the agenda. Would it be now or number three? Now? Say, say again. I, uh, I wanted to bring up something not on the agenda. Oh, okay. I, I think that would be now. Great. Um, so I'm on the Portola Valley Race and Equity Committee, and uh, one thing we have been responsible for or worked on is the land acknowledgement that our town adopted. It's uh, it's on the bottom of the of the town agendas now. And so when this rolled out, um, there was sort of some some different reactions to it. So now our committee is just fielding feedback. So I'm just going to read the land acknowledgement if that's okay. And then I invite, um, since this isn't on the agenda and we can't have discussion about it, I would just invite anybody who has any feedback or thoughts or ideas about this to email me if that's sounds good. Okay, so the land acknowledgement that the town of Portola Valley has adopted is the town of Portola Valley acknowledges the colonial history of this land we dwell upon, the unceded territory of the Ramayko Shaloni, Tamian Nation, and Malek Maloni who endured a human and cultural genocide that included removal from their lands and their sacred relationship to the land. Portola Valley recognizes that we profit from the commodification of lands seized from indigenous people and now bear the ecological consequences. We seek to understand the impact of these legacies on all beings and to find ways to make repair. Yeah, so um, just trying to, like I said, field uh, feedback from other committees to make this land acknowledgement the best one for Portola Valley. So I think everybody has my email address and I welcome your input. Thanks. Okay. Um, other comments from people either online or in the room? I don't see any hands. Okay. So um, I think we can proceed. Um, no announcements or presentations, so that would take us to agenda item four, and that is approval of the minutes from the January 18th meeting. Um, you all have them. Uh, does anyone have any corrections or comments? Or can I have a move, a motion to approve them? Yes. One of the last items was uh, states that there was a recommendation by the committee. So subcommittee of this committee for the audit. I thought that was actually a vote. Yeah, you voted you voted against it. It passed uh, with right. the other ones would have been so it shouldn't say that there was a vote. Okay. Someone moved and effectively passed. 
Sure. Um, would you like that reflected in the meeting minutes? Minutes? Yeah, the minutes usually state that when we when we have a vote on something. Okay. Um, but it um, resolves the second time town council subcommittee of this uh, for the purpose of audit compliance um, be established. Okay. You voted against and the others voted in favor. Right. And it passed. Um, with that change, uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Move to approve the minutes. Okay. Second? Second. Okay. Favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you for that, Ken. And um, let's see. If we uh, can move now to new business, and we're going to start um, on 5A with the town staffing update, and we'd like um, someone from town staff, either Howard or Cindy or someone else, to give us that update. Hey, um, I'm Howard Young. I'm uh, the public works director here for the last 20 years, and then just recently, I'm the uh, interim town manager as assigned by the town council. So. Uh, as you probably know, some of the, there's some turnover on staff right now. Um, at the moment, uh, I also wanted to introduce you to Starla Robinson. She's also helping me um, uh, with some town manager items. And in addition, I've, ass I've assigned her to help out Cindy in the finance department in assisting with the audits and also the budget too, as we're all working together. Um, as for the further staffings within the finance department, I'll let Cindy talk about those. Thank you, Howard. Um, again, my name is Cindy Rodas. I am the finance director with the town. Um, I've also been staffed for um, 14 years. Um, so there have been quite some changes and turnover um, as far as staffing goes. In our last meeting, we discussed um, the uh, possibility of bringing in some temp help to um, get us back up and running and um, provide some more support and backup assistance. So since then we have um, hired somebody. Um, he is through a temp agency. He's been working with us for about three months now. Um, but unfortunately, um, within the past couple of weeks, um, the newly hired, well, newly as of two years ago, um, our finance analyst um, has uh, resigned. Uh, so she will be leaving um, as of Friday. So Friday will be her last day. Um, I quickly went and um, reached back out to the same temp agency to look for additional backup support. Um, so I had somebody start today, actually, um, to begin a little bit of cross-training before Nicole leaves on Friday. Um, so we are in the process of getting um, additional um, support and just continue that same momentum that we were already um, in working progress towards. Um, it, he does come with um, additional um, uh, support services. So we did uh, obtain a higher level um, position. So he is coming in with um, as, as a senior accountant. Um, so it is a, a higher level of, of um, expertise and coming in to help with um, some journal entries, uh, reconciliation, um, and he also has extensive knowledge with um, data integration. Um, so we're hoping to for this to be a really um, good transition. Um, so that's where we are currently. And then also with um, the assistance of Starla Jerome Robinson, um, she was also um, really essential in helping us during uh, a couple years ago, another transition um, when we um, uh, lost our finance director back in 2015. Um, so Starla helped us for quite a few months uh, to get up and running. So she's familiar with, with the town and um, we have a really good working relationship as well. Um, and Jim is also continuing to be a fiscal consultant uh, remotely. You had an analyst and you're you had a permanent your temp situation. The temp is working out. He's been with us for about three months now. 
Um, and he's, he's essentially taking uh, more of the day-to-day -day, um, accounts payable, accounts receivable type of work. Um, and um, with bringing in the new uh, temp uh, to replace Nicole in her departure, um, that uh, position will be primarily focused on reconciliations, um, journal entries, um, there is some um, also experience with uh, forecasting and analysis. Um, so we're hoping uh, to get some of that rolled out as well. And, and, you posted it, I'm sorry, and, and that's still open and you posted it and are you getting it? it, it we're, we're working on getting the recruitment open. So we do plan to recruit for a full-time um, position um, at a later time. Right now, it's just kind of like a temporary um, fix to continue moving forward with some of the projects we were already working towards. Are you still yes, yes. So you're looking for just one full-time employee? Um, we, we intend to have the, both of the positions filled permanently. Um, with all of the new changes, it, it, it is going to be essential that these positions are filled just on a permanent basis. Um, rather than it being temporary. This is, this is going to be an ongoing uh, need. Sure. Um, it, are the other um, departures of town, town um, centered affecting uh, the finance department in an adverse way or how, how is that going? Most definitely. Um, we are all already a very small staff. Um, so with any departure, there's going to be some impact in other departments. Um, again, with also our uh, not having a um, town clerk position filled yet, um, that has also kind of offloaded some additional um, work in day-to-day -day, um, preparation. Um, so, so yes, definitely um, any other vacancies have definitely impacted other departments as well. Any Anything else uh, from you on the staffing update? Um, nothing additional. Okay. Um, have anyone to particularly look at the uh, audits that were? So essentially that would be a portion of what the um, new senior accountant um, would also be uh, assisting me with. Um, there will be a lot of my time that will be taken on bigger projects such as the, the budget um, and then also with some audits. So I will need a little bit of admin help. Um, and of course, um, any kind of uh, cleanup, um, anything that might result from, from the audit, I would need some assistance also from the, the uh, senior accountant. Any comments from members of the public on this agenda item? Nope, okay. We can um, move on to uh, number B, which is related, uh, and this is to discuss to talk about the audit um, status, uh, plans for completion. We've, we've gotten 19 and 20 out of the way, mm -hmm. um, which is great in January, 20 and 21, 2021, 21, 22, are, as everyone knows, still pending. And um, we had high hopes to get these uh, wrapped up here in the near term. Uh, I suspect with staffing uh, being what it is that there may be delays. So I'm, I'm wondering if I, if Cindy, perhaps you could just update me on where you are, um, what resources you need that you still don't have and just how everyone is thinking about um, catching up on these audits and also putting in place processes so that we stay on time once we uh, catch up with the backlog. Yes, definitely. Um, <clears throat> um, with the uh, status on the audit, so currently for fiscal year 2020-21, um, we are in compliance. Unaudited numbers have been submitted to the state controller's office. We have received a um, letter certifying us of that. Um, and I am in the process of doing the same process for fiscal year 2021-22. Um, there are a few reports and things that would need to be generated from our financial system to be able to provide um, the documentation needed to our auditors in order to provide those unaudited numbers. So 
essentially the numbers that are provided to the state controller are uh, reviewed initially by the um, our auditing firm Mays, um, and then they submit um, the formal um, unaudited numbers to the state controller. So that's currently where we are as far as um, unaudited numbers to the state controller for compliance purposes. Um, we are still in the process of um, some data cleanup um, through the challenges that we've experienced with the implementation of the new financial system. Um, so we are in the process of, of getting those um, items cleaned up. Um, uh, one of the um, next steps with uh, bringing in Sarla, we have discussed um, more of like a project timeline. Um, so we, we do intend uh, within the next few weeks, um, Sarla, myself, and Jim uh, to come together and really come up with um, a project timeline to um, have uh, a specific uh, project plan moving forward so that we have um, these, these projects completed. Okay, so it's fair to say that right now there's not a definite or planned date, but that right. you're intending in the next few weeks with the new core team mm -hmm. to put that together and bring that back. Correct. How do you think? Yes. And do we do plan to bring that plan forward to you for review prior to submitting? Sure. We, we don't have to see it in advance. I, I'm just um, making progress on the audit as quickly as you need as you can is, is key. Yes. And this will continue to be a party perennial in the um, agenda here for the Finance Committee, right? Because mm -hmm. we, we need to get this uh, put into the rear view mirror along with everything else that happened during COVID um, so we can. Definitely. Um, any discussion? Do we have a subcommittee now? Is it, is it the town council approved? Well, that's stepped our recommendation. And do we have reestablished a subcommittee? That, that's the next uh, agenda, agenda item to do the discuss formation of the audit subcommittee and inquire from the members of the town council for anything we need to be doing. We don't have a two to fifteen. Oh, um, was it? Did was that ever discussed at the town council level? Yeah, it was just we we had recommended at the last meeting uh, that the town council think about whether it would make sense for us to form a subcommittee of this committee, with two or three members who would be focused on the audit and would be working out a cycle with finance committee uh, meetings with uh, the finance team of the town and with the auditor, Mays and Associates, to make sure that attention is being provided to whatever resource um, deficiencies there may be or just understanding more fully how to help relieve bottlenecks so that this could happen, close um, out. Yeah, and that was um, that was going to be the next thing when we I'm getting ahead of the agenda here. Um, but given the two items are related, uh, where we could elect to form that kind of subcommittee on our own if we wish. Uh, but but first, let me just pause and see if there's any discussion from members of the public about the audit status. Because the so I had recommended. Mm -hmm. um, we have two years to work on that we just do a 24 a month audit. Wasn't viewed positively by May. So why not other than that the C would be in there? <laughs> okay, now why we feel it? Has any discussion been when you're going your plan about how how are we gonna get these two out of the way before the next one? Mm -hmm. Um 
I would appreciate it. I, I think it's still worthwhile to consider a 24 month audit. There's half as many uh, accounts that have to audit. You're just going to get, you had the beginning one, the one the, uh, 22, you're not going to worry about 21. Balance this. And this committee reviewed the last audit. Lot of interest in using money because it was so old. It was so I think that's a good idea for us to keep uh, in front of us. I do think that there's a state requirement that there be an annual audit submitted to the state controller's office. And so that would require that we do both. But we can certainly pursue that and determine it one way or the other. So there's what you just submitted to the office, unaudited statement. Well, that's a different idea. So do it, uh, do two years and submit annually the unaudited numbers. Is that what you're proposing? Well, I'm suggesting that we do not every year, two years. Right, two years. right. Moment because we're so I think it's worth going back to Grace and asking her to give us more detail about why she doesn't think that's a good idea. Yeah, my recollection was she, she didn't think it would save time before, but we should perhaps pressure test that. Right. I, 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 just, just to follow up quickly on something that you mentioned. So we're in compliance based on the unaudited numbers. Is the state giving it, putting any pressure on us to hit a timeline with respect to an audit, or do they do they even require the audit be submitted? There is um, there is a timeline that is um, given by the state controller's office. Um, pressure is is typically in the form of um, any fines if we're not in compliance. Um, so I have been in direct communication with the state controller's office and have provided um, a formal letter um, basically explaining our circumstances um, as far as staffing goes, um, issues that we've already experienced with the um, software system. So they are in receipt of that, um, that letter that explains all of that and basically requesting an extension um, and any waiver of these. Um, as well. So they have uh, received that letter. I haven't received any response back from the state controller's office, um, but I have been in direct communication with, with them on, the, on that front. Okay, great. Thank you. Given that we didn't do anything with the previous audit, I'm not sure what the value of the next audit is going to be if it's only in 2021. And we're already working on, we're going to be working on 23. Yeah, the part where I'm in um, violent agreement is as quick as we can. We want to catch up. We mm -hmm. want to stay behind. Right, not, that's not what this might be anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. I yes. think we have some comments online uh, that I want to get through. Um, Rita, Thomas, uh, do you want to talk to us? Hi, uh, thank you for taking my comments. Uh, first thing, it's really hard to hear any of you. If you could please speak into the microphone so that we online can actually hear you and it will be good for the recording. Appreciate okay. that. Uh, first question, what year did the new financial system start? Uh, I thought it was when Ann Weingart was um, their liaison on this uh, committee. And are we in compliance with the treasury, with the COVID monies? Um, I'm on a finance committee for uh, a nonprofit, and uh, you know we have to submit a lot of things. And I keep asking this question. I haven't really received an answer um, at the last finance meeting. And the third thing is, uh, you know, isn't that part was updated with project-based accounting instead of like? this much money for this consultant company, but actually no, this one worked on the, you know, how much money it was for the safety element, how much so far for the housing element broken down that way. And I know that I'm not the only person that's been asking for that, but then this way uh, the residents can actually go into open.gov, which is not updated and, uh, and actually see these numbers. And it would be a huge help. And I'm sure a lot less pressure on this committee, which is only a committee and not responsible for everything that's done or not done. And I do appreciate the focus on the audit and getting the finances in, in order. 
uh, you know, of course, you know, as a resident, would like for it to be done sooner, especially since on the town council agenda for tomorrow is raising fees, which it's hard for me to understand raising fees when we're not sure how much money we have because the books aren't closed and the audits aren't done. Thank you for listening. Okay, so Rita, some of that was came across as garbled, at least for me, but I'm, I'm gonna try to speak closer to the microphone. Um, what I got were three things out of that. That was what year we had our software installed. Um, how are we on the com complying with COVID monies that were provided and, and something about the housing element breaking out costs related to that. Um, yes, thank you. Cindy, maybe you can comment to the extent you have the answers. Yes, sure. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm still getting over. Um, I was a little sick, very sick, actually. <laughs> um, <clears throat> related to the uh, integration of the new software system, um, the contract was signed in January 2020. Um, the implementation, the go live date was July of 2020. Um, so right during um, COVID, um, that's what, when we rolled out um, the, the new software system. Um, it wasn't actually finalized until I believe it was September of 2021. Um, but there are still a few components of the open gift system that are not fully developed that we're still working with um, their um, executive team to roll those, those items out. Um, in terms of the second item and ARPA related um, compliance, um, we have submitted all of the required compliance um, in accordance with the requirements uh, for the ARPA funding. Um, there is a new, um, or actually the annual report is actually due April 30th. So I'm currently working on that. And um, it, it, the new report will be um, submitted prior to the um, deadline date of the 30th um, this month. Um, the third, comment uh, related to the housing expenses. Um, those items are not um, fully updated automatically within the OpenGov system and what's available online. Um, those reports are static reports. So they're not updated um, with any new um, expenditures. Um, that is part of what I'm also working on with OpenGov and rolling out um, a new system of reporting. So the reports that are provided through the um, online version of the open web system are um, what is called classic reporting. Um, they have a new gen, uh, next gen reporting, excuse me, next gen reporting that is now available, which actually implements um, an, uh, an overnight update um, every night to uh, update any information um, directly from our finance system. So that's part of what I'm also working on um, with OpenGov and rolling that, that part out um, to have real-time updated information. And so that real-time updates would include the housing element breakouts? Every expenditure Got that it. the town Every pays and, and authorizes through their warrant list. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think uh, David Cardinal has his hand up. David? Uh, Sure, hopefully you can hear me. Uh, two quick comments. One, uh, as far as the uh, speaking, I think the trick is that, sadly, you need to speak directly into the microphone and not turn towards the other panelists. So we can hear George, but if Ken turns towards George, we can't hear the microphone. So that's just a technical note. And on the, the dollars, I, I think, we're doing great personally. So I'm I'm good with what we spent and all of that. So I, I'm I don't have any complaints. So thank you. Great. Thanks for the tip. Yeah, it's hard to avoid. I'm I'm here in person. I want to look at people, but uh, mm -hmm. then no one else can hear me, which may be a relief for some of you, but probably not good transparency. Um all right. So uh that was the audit status. Um, now we're going to move to C, which is the audit subcommittee. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, please.
That new open box system. Yeah. And Caroline, let me just try to restate uh, what you said so people online can hear it because we didn't have a microphone. So what Caroline was asking, and correct me if I if I missed this, was that um, you believe that the open gov system would link straight through on transactions to the in underlying invoice. And you had some concern with some larger lump sum payments that were an agglomeration of more than one invoice, say for consulting fees, uh, without that level of detail. And you're asking, what are our plans in that regard for the town? Is that right? In regards to the um, invoicing details, um, the open gov system will not provide actual um, a view of the actual invoice that received. Um, through through the transparency portal, it will be line item information as far as what's charged, but not an actual view of the invoice. I just want to clarify that. Um, but it it should provide um, detailed information as far as where um, the expenditure is going to. Um, <clears throat> um, and um, with the um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, so that was, I just want to clarify that, that portion. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't provide that level of detail. Um, as far as Cotton Shires is, um, concerned, we use them for a number of, so Cotton Shires is our geologist. We use them for a number of different services. Um, so there may be some, uh, items related to the, um, um, the housing. Um, but also we have applicant charges. So for private development um, that we use cotton shires for as well. So there should be a differentiation between um, total expenditures for cotton shires. Okay, so um, what I get from that is we won't be able to physically see the invoices, but we will get more granular detail transaction by transaction and that the invoices exist in the files internally. Yes, exactly. Okay. I don't see any other hands on that issue, so I think we can talk about the subcommittee. Um, <clears throat> I guess the understanding is that if we think we want one, we can have one. Um, but we should discuss whether that's um, warranted or not. Uh, I know that Ken has had a different view. I, I guess uh, the topic for discussion with everyone here, um, <laughs> I'm looking at Ken again, sorry. I, I, will, I will avert my eyes from Ken. Um, <laughs> But the, but the idea uh, is how do we um, try to increase the attention the committee is paying to the audit in between our meetings in a way where we can be you know, not annoying, obviously, to the town, but helpful. And to the extent perhaps Mays and Associates may, may have competing priorities with other towns or other activities, uh, squeaky wheels tend to get greased, and if uh, the subcommittee is sort of squeaking at them every week, perhaps that would help them prioritize things. If um, the uh, uh, the finance team in town hall are facing all the pressures of complying with reporting requirements and also catching up with the audit and whatever, if, if more resources are needed, the subcommittee members can be more aware of that and liaise with the town council. So that, that was my thinking. Uh, I think the thinking of many of the town residents who had sort of prompted us to think about this. Um, if we could do it some other way, that's okay too, but I just want to open up the conversation about whether this is indicated. So uh, my, my concern, George, is that 
a subcommittee that strives to do the things you were just describing uh, is just as likely to cause more problems and more delay um, as staff now have to pay attention to our requests rather than getting it done through May. Um, Woodside seems to not have a problem. They also use May. So it isn't clear to me that um, growing more people um, into the pot here is going to accelerate. It may actually have the opposite effect. Anyone else thinking on that? You've heard from me, you've heard from Ken. It'd be great to hear from others. Um, <clears throat> so my recollection is that partly this is uh, in response to requests from a lot of members of the public and also maybe uh, some council members positing the idea of the formation of a new audit committee, of an independent committee. And I'm not sure that that would actually happen, but I think that our committee was considering the subcommittee sort of as a response to public requests uh, for a greater level of transparency and focus to whatever extent um, a new group focused on the audit would offer that. So I think partly for our committee, we're you know, considering whether we wanna respond to that public request or whether that would be valuable. And you know, I don't know how many members of the public that is, but there were some at our meetings. Yeah, that was that was the idea. And um, uh, I, I understand the point that it could um, just have more people bothering folks, which isn't what you want. On the other hand, um, in my work in business, if you involve um, supervisory personnel and focus them on a particular matter, it can, it can sometimes help, and um, I think the full name of this committee is the Finance and Audit Committee, so we're supposed to be doing this. It could be a subcommittee of the whole if we wanted to, or we could designate a couple of people to focus on this, or we could just continue as we have been to try to um, uh, touch base uh, with Cindy and the finance team on a regular basis. Um, the, the key point, again, and here I, I you know, throw this back to the staff level is what would be helpful to you in terms of making this happen? Uh, again, this sh shouldn't be one more thing on your to-do list because that would be Ken's point. It's just going to take longer, in which case it's not a good idea. If it would be useful to be able to highlight uh, where additional resources needed in a more timely way to get you help, that would be fine. If it would be helpful to get more attention from Mays and Associates, by having them have to have a meeting with us or something like that. And that would help you get a response from them. Though then we're a tool that you could use in that respect, right? So what, what do you think? Um, I think, I think some more communication, I think it would definitely be helpful to move forward with the plan that we've already kind of discussed and uh, moving forward with developing a, a timeline as far as the, the audit goes and um, preparing um, realistic timeframe as far as having the audit completed um, and bringing that plan forward. We can still report directly, whether it's with this, a subcommittee um, or with directly just the entire finance committee. Um, I think that would probably be the best approach um, is really just kind of doing that initial analysis and within at uh, the staff level to determine what um, next steps forward um, with the changes of staffing um, and then also bringing in Mays also and in, in, in checking in with them as far as what their schedules also look like um, because that can that will also um, impact uh, our timeline as well. Um, so I think there needs to be a little bit of, of further discussion first in, uh, at the staff level, as well as with Mays, and then we can bring forward um, a plan. Um, I don't, I don't really have any uh, specific feeling with having a, a subcommittee. So whether we report directly to the subcommittee or um, check in with the finance committee as a whole, um, that's fine as well. But I think first steps. Um, would be that discussion um, at the staff level 
um, and then also incorporating maize. Next question. Yeah, I, I'm, I wasn't here for the discussion uh, last time, but um, I think I'm kind of aligned with Ken's point, unless it, it, it's a well-defined kind of set of uh, kind of exactly what this audit committee would be doing and what the tasks are and what the, uh, just what their role is. Um, it seems to me that this is more of a finance committee type of, uh, of a responsibility. At least that would have been my assumption. Um, so again, I'm open to it. But if if uh, if we do move in that direction, I'm just curious what the uh, what the exact role of the audit committee would be, or subcommittee. Yeah. No. I I have we been probably the only accountant on the committee here. <laughs> I actually did a, one or two audits in my lifetime. Um, I, I agree with. You. Certainly, if we're not going to add value, which I don't see us, other than hearing the response, you know, I think I think the first step is just to, as you say, take the steps you mentioned and report back to us. And if, if then we think the subcommittee makes sense, otherwise, I think the committee as a whole is on the board. And and then you can you're allowed to communicate to send us emails on status. Yes. Bill, what do you think? It sounds like we're taking back our vote from last time to create a subcommittee. Is that? Sounds it. We talked about revoting. Let me explain my vote to create a subcommittee. It was solely because I had the belief that there's a very limited number of people on this committee that have the experience and knowledge to actually listen to the details, the, understand the issues that an auditor would have that Cindy is dealing with to add value. I'm not, I'm not one of those people. I'm an investment cash flow kind of guy. So I voted for it because I thought we could identify maybe subcommittee could be as little as two members, correct? Um, that could really dig into it because it sounds to me from this report that there's going to be more work requirement on a couple of people to help you know understand where the things are to pull things together get additional resources or focus or come back to this committee if you need something special you know some kind of an allocation to like break through some log jam whatever that is uh, because i'm not gonna be able to add any value sitting as a finance committee listening to the audit issues that was the only reason i voted if my assumption is wrong then i guess we would take it back. But I still think it's a good idea if there's a couple of people who could say, yes, I'll be the subcommittee. And we've had many subcommittees in, in the past um, both about different things, and we didn't have to set up a different structure. We just had really two or three people that worked on something. They came back to the full committee and made a report. I would imagine that's what I would hope the audit subcommittee would do as well and provide direct contact with you know, the team here until they're ready to make their report or bring a new problem forward to the finance committee or the town council. Yes, Judith. And, and for those online who couldn't hear due to lack of microphone, that was Judith Hasco, and she was pointing out that an advantage of declaring something a subcommittee is a cohort of members can operate in a less formal fashion without, you know, legal agendas and all the rest as you're doing these more casual interactions with town staff or um, the audit auditor in order to report back. Okay, well, I, I don't know exactly where we're landing here because there are sort of two points of view. Um, one is uh, it, it, if a couple of people wanted to focus on this, um, that could be useful and they could do that as a subcommittee. Uh, on the other hand, um, the finance team is telling me that they need a few weeks to have a project plan, which they will report to us, um, certainly could report to me through me, and then I can 
you know, reach out and inform all of you. Uh, we may want to table this until our next meeting, um, perhaps. Uh, I'll throw that out there for everyone to consider since I don't see a strong opinion in favor right now. Um, there's some arguments in favor, but there's a, uh, I would say probably a majority who feel that the whole committee should be involved. Is that fair? I think so. Yes. Well, if, if I can just add, I, I think that tabling it to the next meeting is an excellent idea. I think Cindy and I and Jim can put together a timeline and a task list. And then the audit committee, if you decide to form one, will have something to work off of, right? Like where are pain points? Where are inefficiencies? What needs to get done? What, you know, is there something on our end? Is there something on open gov's okay. end or the auditor? And and perhaps later in this process, the finance committee would in fact add leverage in dealing with some of those external um, folks. Right, that, that sounds reasonable to me. Um, hands I see back up. First, anyone in the room here? Um, going back to David Cardinal. Oh, thanks. Uh, I think that from what we need, the Finance Committee is perfectly capable of reading the financials. And I've been involved in large corporations. We had audit committees and this and that. But I don't see what value that would add um, in our case. Like, what would they do that we aren't already doing? Uh, we have a good auditor. They do a good job when you get them the data. Um, and we have our financials. If you think the financials are wrong, then the time to uh, deal with that is before they're submitted. So in a corporation, the audit committee helps if you think the management is doing something kind of wrong, but our finance committee, to some extent, is the management. So I, I'm, I don't know if we want to have one, great, but I don't see it adding, uh, what are they going to do that's different than we, what we're doing now, except spend more taxpayer dollars on staff to support them. So that's my naive, perhaps, thought. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rita, I think you have your hand up. Uh, yes, and I hope you can hear me. Um, sorry where I am. It's not, um, my connectivity is not very good. But, um, you know, I was part of the group that suggested that we have a separate audit committee. Uh, this, this group, this committee is wonderful. But with the severe delay of the current financials and the audits, this is not just this year's audit, but you know, for several years. And we're we're basically talking about almost the exact same committee and the um, same employees, at, well, along with some um, temporary help. And if there is a way that the people, the residents that are quite concerned, can help with this, even put together an outline so we can move forward or the residents can feel that something is moving forward, that would be wonderful. Thank you for listening. Sure, that, that's um, an interesting point. I think involving other residents who aren't on this committee though would involve the town council in some way, shape or form. Um, and uh, Judith is nodding yes. Uh, so I, I appreciate the comment, but I think that moves beyond where we are. Um, I think that closes out this issue uh, without objection from anyone here. I think we'll table this until the next time we get together. And oh, someone in the back. Um, yeah, the, the, the question was that, can the auditor be present? Um, Typically, the auditors are here when they have the audit for discussion. At, at our last meeting, Grace Zhang was here uh, when we discussed the uh, 1920, fiscal year 1920 audit. Um, but I don't know that she would just be here at other times given her schedule. Maybe, Cindy, you can comment on that. <clears throat> yes, typically um, in the past when we have um, an audit item, an actual document in, uh, in review in front of us, then we do um, extend an uh, invitation to our auditors to be present to answer any questions. So 
we can do the same moving forward. Um, I, again, with her schedule, I'm not sure if she can commit to um, being here on a regular basis for every um, committee meeting, but definitely if we have an audit item on the agenda, I can always check with her and her schedule um, and see if she should be available. And would she be able to participate remotely perhaps? Um, in other words, one thing that might help that I, I taking away from this comment is um, if she were to be online after you have your project plan and you, you know buy into the plan, if you would, that that sometimes is useful, right? So she commits to it because I've heard in the past there's been sometimes some delays where you're expecting something in a couple of weeks, but then there's a month delay or what have you that may be less likely if she actually commits to the project plan right. at, at a meeting with us. So may, may, this is something to think about. Yes. And, and I see, um, David, is your hand up again or is that from last time? Okay, I'm not hearing from you. Sorry, you may have just left your hand up from the last. Any, any other comments on this item or are we ready to move on to item D? Okay, um, let's move on to item D and this is the budget plan for fiscal year 23-24. Budget cycle is coming up. Um, Again, as everyone knows, we've had a good deal of turnover, including of the town manager. Uh, and so um, things are no doubt a little bit more exciting than usual. Cindy, you can maybe tell us what you're planning to do, Howard, whoever wants to talk about the process this year. Yes, um, I, can, I can start out and then um, have um, additional uh, comments. Um, with the, the plan moving forward with the upcoming budget preparation for fiscal year 2023-24, um, the, there are a number of, um, of items that we would really like to focus um, our budget uh, preparation around. Um, mainly there is a renegotiation for the sheriff's contract. Um, so that has been a huge component um, of a, a rather large expenditure on, um, on our budget on an annual basis. Um, with the upcoming negotiations, um, the draft um, contract that they proposed it is, is quite um, an increase uh, to the contract. Um, so how, how it much is, can you comment? Uh, it's about 800, about 800,000. Um, in percentage terms, what is that? Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. This was just just recently. Um, so it's it's kind of having to an impact on us and having to reevaluate how we're preparing the budget mm -hmm. um, moving forward, um, along with um, some staff turnover as well. Um, as you mentioned, our town manager um, is gone. We um, have Howard as interim um, in the meantime, um, but the uh, town manager, Jeremy, in the past has provided a lot of uh, support and uh, contribution to the, the budget. So um, in light of, of uh, a number of changes, um, also some impacts with um, the, the system, the open gov system and reevaluating um, what these large expenditures would be um, what we were proposing is um, essentially um, taking our current budget with a few modifications um, and, and really planning um, that uh, moving forward with our budget. Um, and then at a later time, um, we, maybe when we do have a permanent uh, town manager, we can always bring forward a revision at a later time uh, to incorporate any um, changes, um, any updated information that we may have related to sheriff's contract or other expenditures of uh, information that we do not have at this time. Um, so that's the initial plan uh, moving forward um, as far as the, the budget. Um, and then I'll, I'll let um, Starla or Howard um, add any additional. I think so, Cindy summed her up correctly. I mean, the Sheriff contract is a big component that we found out last week. In fact, it, there is a study session if you want to listen in on on this Wednesday, uh, where the sheriff department is going to come and also speak to the reasons for the increase. And at, at this moment, 
uh, they're indicating the, the, indica the reasons for the increase is for items they believe were not included um, there in, in, in the original scopes. Because we have a very basic scope, but they're looking, you know, they're concerned about basically cost recovery uh, of all their, all their services that they provide. And so if you want to hear more about it, I think you should listen in on the council meeting uh, Wednesday. So, but it, 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 is a, it is a big amount that we're going to have to, we're going to have to really look into the, the, our, our general fund. Um, obviously, you probably know the amounts, but it's, you know, it's probably not sustainable. Um, and what are we going to do about it? So those things we'll have to, because we just found out, we'll have to marinate it more on it. We'll have to discuss it at the uh, uh, presentation on Wednesday night. When, when does the current contract expire? Does this June thirtieth? Okay, so this is this coming fiscal year. Yes. Is, is the eight hundred thousand over the contract or annually? Okay. So like Two point four million. It's like a three year. And, Inflation and, wasn't that, and that, and that was the increase, right? So the the total is how much now? It's like um, I, I think it's two point three plus or annual. minus annually, for, right? For one and a half people. For twenty four hour coverage, every it's three sixty five days a year. Well, what, but it's one and a half. Don't we it's share? one. It's don't one. Share? I thought we shared half. Of you don't care anymore. Uh, there are some auxiliary services, a portion of a detective, a portion of administration, of an administrative sergeant, but the coverage in Portola Valley is one person 24 hours a day. I, 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 think, I think the way I heard it described in a conversation I had with Greg Monks was that it was, we had a dedicated, Woodside had a dedicated and we each share half of the room. Right. Is that correct? Well, it, it may have been at some point, but they're saying at this time, it's one person in Portola Valley 24 hours a day. Okay, so it's not, yeah, all right. So we're not able to share. I'm sorry, and so that one person, again, how much? Two years? Oh, well, the one person, I mean, it's not just one person, right? It's just somebody is present, but it's still, I think, $2.3 million a year. Well, it, 24 hours, so it's right. Right, but there is a proposal. It is on the council agenda, and I would so that we're not giving you misinformation because we're not really prepped to talk about it today. Okay. I would encourage you to attend that because, it, I mean, it's going to you know we cannot identify eight hundred thousand dollars in the budget that can can pay for that in addition to all the other existing services. Well, we now have a new top item for the finance. <laughs> Any dates as to when we would see the budget? The budget then, or you... So the plan uh, for the budget is is essentially what we've done every year. So we typically bring it forward to the finance committee at the end of uh, May for the initial review, um, with a recommendation to move it forward to council at their first meeting in June. Um, and then, of course, we have the public hearing at the second meeting of June uh, for formal adoption. So we plan to still continue with that same timeline and still, still the same process. Um, and essentially today, um, what we're looking for is just a recommendation from the uh, finance committee to move forward with the, the plan that we're proposing is, is really just um, essentially taking our current existing budget with some modifications um, to also incorporate these, these uh, known expenditures at this time. So right now we're scheduled May. The week, yes, the, the week of the last week of May. Week yeah, and I may, I, I, I need to be in Europe on that date, so I may try to change this if we can, if I'm needed to be here uh, for May 30th. Twenty third, I'm, I'm actually need to be in Europe on business, and I apologize for that. We, we can take scheduling offline. Yes. Right, because I'm the one creating the problem here. But um, anyway, end of May. Yes, yes, end of May. And um, the proposal sounds reasonable to me that we just carry forward and then seek input from obviously the town council on priorities and um, 
teaching is going to be how we manage the public safety budget. Anyone? I'm assuming there's no alternative to the sheriff department. <laughs> but I have to say, not in the timeline that we have in front of us right now. That there may be ways to massage the proposed agreement, I'm not leaving negotiations out of the discussion. But I think the big numbers need to be known by the community. Do you know what other um, municipalities use the same contract mechanism that we do with the same department? I, I think when we met with them, they said there were approximately eight other units. I think Half Moon Bay, there's a small group, uh, Broadmoor, which is a neighborhood in Daly City. Um, Woodside, yes, of course, the obvious. Um, and those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. I'd be curious about whether they're seeing the same kind of proposed increase. In other words, we, we don't necessarily have visibility unless we ask for it on you know, how they're allocating their, their costs. We see what resource they give us, but we don't know how they allocate the costs. I remember we had a project that 10 years ago and sat down with them to understand it. It was incredibly eye-opening to me of how many line items we end up paying for, some of which you wouldn't even think of anything to do with police in Pocola Valley, but it's in some manner they do. I just want to make sure that we're at least, regardless of how big the increase is, at least it's equ equitable across other you know, entities that they may be providing services for. So I, I think that's a really good point. When we met with them, they explained to us that this is the outcome of a, a service study and that they have recently gone through a cost allocation study. And so these numbers are the result of that cost allocation study. Now, you know, I, I think there are, will certainly be arguable elements of what we should be paying for versus what others should be paying for. So we could look more deeply at it, but I think the big numbers are still going to be more than we're paying now. Yeah, overhead allocation is, of course, a black art. So uh, I once was at a company where uh, I, I discovered that the most profitable division was the most profitable division because they were successful in laying off all their costs on the other division. And it, it reflected political power more than economic reality. And I wonder if some of that isn't going on here. Uh, do uh, Palo Alto and Menlo Park, are they in the business of contracting out a couple of police cars? Or is that something we've ever discussed? Or? Well, Again, I think these are important questions for the council to talk about, but I think most uh, governmental units have discovered over time that contracting out is not profitable and uh, they lean away from doing it these days. Okay. More discussion here from the members? Yes, uh, well, the public's next. Members? Public. Those are all good points. Um, and indeed, um, something that will come back when town staffing settles down a bit. Uh, originally for this agenda, I was hoping to talk about some of the longer term implications financially of implementing on the new housing element over the coming years and exactly what we were discussing because as we add more and different kinds of housing, we'll put stress on things like roads and public safety and other things. And uh, we don't wanna fix one problem and you know cascade straight into another one. 
So, uh, but we'll we'll wait for a town manager to help us out with that. Anyone online want to comment on this before we move on? Okay. Um, great. Next Wednesday, town council. We'll find out about tomorrow. Or are we? Oh, it's tomorrow. tomorrow. I'm sorry. Wow. Okay. And where on the agenda is the? Uh, I mean, like, is there a rough time? <laughs> well, that's. Thank you for pointing that out. Here, I was thinking I had a week. Come on. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I hope. So. <laughs> Great. Okay. Yes. There are there are things upcoming with the post adoption housing element too. There's consulting costs so that haven't been determined yet. So there are, you know, there's not only this cost, but there are other costs too that consider that are coming up also. So thank you. If, if I can, so the just to answer the question about other jurisdictions the sheriff covers, they include Half Moon Bay, San, City of San Carlos, City of Milbrae and the smaller areas, Broadmoor, Eichler Highlands, and North Fair Oaks, as well as Portola Valley. Oh, and Woodside, yes. Okay, um, thank you for that. We'll move on. Um, the next is, we, we do have a subcommittee. Sorry, George, I just wanted to, just to um, recap on the last, um, I just wanted to clarify if it was um, okay to move forward if it was the committee's recommendation to move forward with the plan as proposed for the budget. Should, should we have a motion and a vote on that? Or is that, is that needed? I, I would say yes, that would be for okay. clarification. Uh, do I hear a motion to proceed uh, with the recommendation to proceed on the budget as Cindy proposed? So the motion that is to, for you to prepare Budget. Yes, so it would still be uh, brought forward for review by the Finance Committee at the uh, last week of May, but essentially the preparation of the budget will include um, the current existing budget for 22-23 um, with some modifications um, with existing known items that will impact uh, for the upcoming year. So it, it sounds like what you're saying is you're going to take the current budget, you're going to roll most of it forward, tweak it a bit for inflation or cost of living or some other factor, do some adjustments. You haven't told us specifically what those are, how many those would be, those would be kind of things, one off, different line items. Mm -hmm. They're not simply going to be rolled forward with a, a generalized you know, five or eight percent increase or whatever it is for the next year. And you're going to make revenue project. You didn't tell us what you're going to do on the revenue side. All I've read that there's some expectation property tax revenues will actually drop from what they were. But um, what kind of projections are you likely to make on the revenue side? Are you simply going to roll forward last year as well? With on the revenue side, not very much, not very many changes on the revenue side. Um, one known uh, change or increase on the revenue side will be uh, in relation to the UUT. So um, with the, um, the timing and um, there was no changes on the last, um, uh, any new ballot measures. So we are now uh, transitioning as of July 1st um, for the increase of the seven and a half percent. So we'll increase by 1% on the UUT side. Um, so that, that will be the only change that we know of um, as far as um, increasing revenue um, with property taxes. Yeah, we don't anticipate any um, increases on that side, um, really just looking at um, more of a, um, a, a more modest um, change as far as- uh, Just so I remember the history on this, the reason you say there's gonna be a 1% higher UUT is that the four year mm -hmm. voter approved temporary or four year reduction by 1% expires and there was not another ballot measure put on the last ballot in time to keep it 
reduced by 1%. Is that correct? Correct. Was that in was that was that intentionally done by that way with the council, or is it just something got lost in the this all the COVID related things? Yeah, I don't I don't have any any detailed information on that. Um, I don't I don't I don't know how that was um, the plan for that to to move forward. Does anybody on the committee know? I don't I I don't recall this coming before us. It hasn't, in the past. It hasn't been. It wasn't discussed in, uh, in, uh, last August. It would have been last August, September, to put it on a November ballot. Mm -hmm. it, it was probably. Yeah, no, this was not discussed. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't miss anything. I mean, it, it was not discussed. It may, it may turn out to be fortuitous given we've just had the public safety, you know, bomb drop on us fiscally, but. That would be a situation of being lucky rather than planning. Yes. Okay. And, and for those on line, the, the suggestion uh, was that we look, the town look to its rental revenue from various um, properties it owns that it leases. That's something to look at. Yes, Howard. Oh, no, it didn't. I didn't move. <laughs> you did move. Is there a second? On the uh, proceeding with the budget as just discussed. In favor? Aye. Aye. Vote present. All right, we, we, we have um, uh, Mr. Urban voted present, but everyone else voted on. All right, so it passes. Um, so next we'll move on to item E, which is a report from the Inclusionary Housing Fund Subcommittee and discussion. Uh, just by way of um, background for everyone, at the last meeting we um, discussed how to allocate inclusionary housing funds. Uh, there are various funds in the town that comprise, I think, nearly $5 million. And this came up because I believe the Willows project developers uh, essentially requested something like three and a half million dollars in, uh, in uh, uh, support for uh, some of their low income units there. And that brought, brought clear the fact that we uh, probably should work on some criteria that we would recommend to the town council to think about and just help um, create some structure uh, around a lot of money and how do we uh, utilize it most effectively. And so with that, I will I'll hand it over to Stephen to report on the subcommittee. Uh, thanks, George. Um, so the subcommittee was myself, George, and Lucy. Um, we had a, a number of communications. Uh, Jeremy was involved at, at the beginning as well, had some, had some thoughts that he shared. Um, we have a, call it a 4.6 to $4.9 million inclusionary house fund, uh, housing fund um, that we're looking to to optimize how we use it and what is the correct strategy um, in terms of moving forward. Um, the goal is to optimize the use of the funds so that it actually creates uh, units of, of affordable housing. Um, and at the same time, incentivizing developers, but but not in a way that uh, results in, in excessive profits because the point is to try to bridge the gap between maybe a, a project that might not be viable um, and make it viable. Um, we looked at a number of options. Um, they kind of fell into three buckets. That's how we're going <clears> to, <throat> excuse me, discuss them, um, and then we'll we'll have a recommendation. But uh, I want to open it up for discussion as well. Um, first is is to purchase a site um, as an alternative to Dorothy Ford Park uh, for low income housing. Um, Jeremy had. I don't know if he had discussions, but uh, had had explored the possibility of acquiring property owned by George Stern's family or heirs. It's about 20 to 30 acres behind town center. 
And the thought was maybe have half of it for, for uh, inclusionary housing and maybe half for a park or open space. And maybe there's ways to, to use the fund from the IHF fund, but also maybe parks and, um, and open space funds to accomplish that. Um, so that's one idea, and it could be it could be another parcel of, of land. Obviously, there's not a lot of these opportunities within the town, uh, so the opportunity set would be quite small. Um, another option would be to dedicate the funds to improve or decrease the visual impact of of another large uh, low income housing project, for example, at, at Dorothy Ford Park. Um, this uh, could potentially move the needle in terms of getting community buy in and approval of the project. Um, and would augment a, a, another large project um, and theoretically use most, if not all of the funds for, for something like that. Um, and then the third would be to um, provide a, a, a subsidy uh, to developers that are seeking to build um, market rate housing, um, but there would be a below market rate component um, as a requirement to, to uh, construct the, the project. And in this case, the subsidy would go towards, again, um, uh, making that particular, particular project viable with incremental uh, units of affordable housing. Um, so those are kind of the three buckets. Um, the options one and two, um, and the opportunity set is small. We, may, we don't really control uh, to some degree um, either of those. Um, it was, as George mentioned, um, the Willow Commons had requested a subsidy in, 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 in their development. So it's not, um, it's not something that we haven't seen, um, but there may not be a lot of opportunities to do that. And we've, we've got a lot of money sitting in this fund that we wanna get to use, get to use uh, sooner than later. Um, so we think option three, which is the uh, subsidy for developers to include additional uh, below market rate housing in their projects uh, would be the way to, to get the funds out hopefully soon um, and in a way that's impactful and, uh, and does move the needle in, in getting incremental units. Um, if, if we go this route, the town would also, uh, we think, uh, well, the town council would decide on, on the applicants um, in terms of uh, whether the applications are approved and whether the subsidy is granted. Um, we would also uh, advise that they come up with a, a set of guidelines that provide some level of clarity to developers so they know uh, kind of what they need to do to, uh, to qualify uh, for the subsidy um, and obviously included in their, in their budgets. Um, we also think that some uses that could kind of go alongside that would be to have uh, the fund cover uh, deed restriction monitoring. So as, as these units are deed restricted for the next 40, 50 years, that they're tracked and that uh, compliance is, is, uh, is confirmed over time as well as potentially hiring a consulting firm to help kind of help the town think through how to implement um, this strategy going forward. And again, how to optimize the, uh, the allocation of these funds. Um, and then in the meantime, while, while we're looking to, to support developers in, in constructing additional affordable housing, um, look to, to, to add options one and two that, that I discussed a minute ago in terms of the potential acquisition of a large parcel uh, for affordable housing or to augment something like uh, the Dorothy Ford Park project to the extent we can improve the parking and, and shielding and other, other ways to make it a, a, a more acceptable project to the community. Um, so that's, those are kind of the key, um, the key outline of, of what we discussed. Um, there could be discussion about whether, what the subsidy should be. We've, we've assumed $100,000 per unit. Um, in, in, the, in the case of, of new construction. Um, we think that is a reasonable number that, um, that is impactful, uh, but will also go a long way in terms of hopefully developing a large number of units. Um, we also discussed the potential for there to be some sort of scale. So to the extent it's deed restricted as a very low income unit versus a low income unit, perhaps that gets additional, um, uh, additional uh, funding in terms of the subsidy. Um, very low income units, the economics are significantly less attractive to a developer than a low income unit. So that's the theory there. Um, we also discussed ADUs and JADUs, and I don't know if we want to go into that detail, but um, because we want these funds to actually provide additional 
units as opposed to maybe reward, reward people for, for bead restricting ADUs or JADUs. Um, it, gets, it gets complicated to, to, to allow uh, or to, to allocate funds from this fund in support of ADUs and JADUs. Um, we're not sure it actually will encourage additional development of ADUs and JADUs or bead restriction of those units. It's such a big financial commitment for somebody to build an ADU and then bead restrict it. Um, our thought is that $100,000 really won't move the needle there. So it would be more of a reward for, for somebody doing something that's great for the community and altruistic and so forth, but we're not sure it actually uh, will encourage additional uh, development of ADUs and JADUs. So that's kind of where we ended up on that on that front. And I, that's, that's really it. So I don't know if you want to open up to discussion. Great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Stephen, any um, discussion from committee members, comments? Steve, I have a question. Uh, if you purchase a site, what, what do you then do with the land? Yeah, you'd be, a, in, I think the concept would you be a partner in the development uh, of, of low-income housing with a developer. So that's a subsidy. Yeah. That's a huge sub. I mean, it could be a huge sub. It could be, and I think, I think the reason the town would consider that is if it's a very impactful subsidy in, in, in the sense that it'll generate a number of units as opposed to a few units, a large yeah. number of units as opposed to a few units. Yeah, I think where, where that came from was uh, Jeremy had talked about this uh, parcel behind us here, um, where he had been talking with George Stern before he passed away um, about some kind of deal where they might be able to combine the park fund and the inclusionary housing fund and acquire the parcel. Then you'd reserve half of it for park land and would be able to use the land to effectively give to a developer if you would, but you, you would bring a developer in who could then build units on uh, land owned by the town and build a number of units, say 50 low-income units, for example, and, and that would uh, relieve the pressure on um, developing the uh, Dorothy Ford Park uh, at the gateway to the town. And so that was an alternative. And it, as mentioned here, it's low probability because after George passed away. Apparently, the ownership was complex with his heirs, and conversations didn't really hadn't moved forward at that point. And now Jeremy has left the town, so I don't know where we are. But we were simply trying to um, express the notion that if if something like that were to present itself, that could be a structural opportunity to really do something with the funding rather than small subsidies. For you. Any other questions, comments on the committee? It sound more or less, um, you know, uh, obviously Lucy and Stephen and I have been discussing it, but we're interested in Bill, Michelle, and do you have any thoughts? I'm sorry, so what's the next step? Well, it would be whether we should um, submit this recommendation, I would think, to the town council. Of, you know, we, we wrote up what we described, what Stephen just read to you, as something for them to consider as they think about how to use these. Was things. your recommendation option three? For us? It, it, it was to focus on option three, but keep in mind options one and two, because you can't focus on one and two because they're sort of um, the kind of thing that they may or may not present themselves. Right. Yes, Judy. So, Stephen, um, Can someone get a microphone? Yeah, let's try to get a microphone to Judy for this. You can just hand it out. Thank you, David. Sorry, everyone online. Some someday this will be automatic, and we'll we'll just do this automatically. But not yet. I'll just come up here. Um, okay, can you hear me? Yes, Dave. All good. Okay. Um, so, a Mary Hufty and I are a subcommittee. And we've been tasked with outreach to finance to um, the diversity and equity committee. And um, we would probably benefit from a real time discussion with the subcommittee. And uh, I don't know if you have a subcommittee, you have a document that you kind of came up with. Yeah, so Mary and I would like to meet with you to understand it a little bit more. 
I think that you can make whatever recommendation you want right now, but what we're looking to do is to have a range of options. It's not just one, but like a ranking. So that what you've done already has that implicitly in it. But when we also look at the, the equity and inclusion uh, aspect, we want to, you know, it's got to be a more a 360 kind of um, uh, discussion. So whether you make a recommendation and then we convene or whether you want to have that meeting and then finalize your recommendation, that's something you should decide. And I'm, I'm neutral, however you want to do it. Um, the other consideration was on JADUs. Those are within existing buildings. Did you talk about the Im impact of 100,000 on a JADU as opposed to an AD, which I understand yeah. that analysis? Yeah, no, it's a good question. And yes, we, we looked at that. And I, we do think there's a difference. Um, certainly from the construction standpoint, uh, $100,000 could go a long way towards those modifications. Mm -hmm. um, so I do agree that it may make more sense there. Where I get, where it's a little bit uh, uh, more of a leap for me is, is by deed restricting a house for 50 years <clears throat> because it has a JADU, that's a big financial impact and big financial commitment. So again, not sure the 100,000 will move the needle in that respect. Yeah, and, and it's a discussion point. I'm not clear whether we're just trying to open up housing at all categories, meaning the deed restriction may not be necessary to sure. incentivize housing and more units yeah. in town on the theory that if people can move to the units they can afford, then something becomes more affordable. So there, there is that aspect as well and where you would weight the use of the funds. Yeah. I think I, I get it. I'm reading in where you would, but I think making those points more explicit in whatever documentation you end up submitting to the subcommittee and then to the town council would be helpful to us right. for that discussion. Yeah, and, and certainly agree that, that incremental housing of any form will help with the overall housing cost. Um, the question is, would, is that appropriate use for inclusionary housing? Exactly. It may be, but yeah. that's not how I viewed it initially, but it's, it's worth looking at. And it would be fine to say that. I mean, I think that these are really complicated issues and to the extent you've thought about it, we, we would love to hear that. Um, but the idea is to get to a point where we have another number of options. And I don't think any of this is gonna be linear. I think we're gonna have to be opportunistic so if all of a sudden um, the property in back of town center became viable, my understanding is right now it's a very confused situation legally and uh, with the people's interest in it being in flux, um, that if that became available, we might wanna to pivot to that. So we need a recommendation that helps us weight things and you know whatever context around that you wanna put would be really helpful to us. So, but thank you for the work you've already done. It's going to be really helpful. Uh, we've just got to get a policy pulled together in the relatively near future. Well, I, I think my recommendation, given the subcommittee that you just told us about, is for us to get together as you just, okay. just described before we do any formal recommendation. Yeah. To talk further, particularly about the JADU issue that you just brought up, right? Which, um, yeah. Really yeah. So I'll get together with Mary and we'll coordinate yep. with your subcommittee and uh, we'll do the same Lucy for your committee. And hopefully, and there may be others to touch base with, but you two were the, the ones we wanted to start with. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. It's great. So I George, think um, yes, can you go through again? These funds are coming from the inclusionary fund. Right. What's the legal use of those funds? Yeah, I, I believe that they're for affordable housing, uh, but I don't know, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know what the exact restrictions are, but they were part of, um, you know, they come from various subdevelopments uh, where when somebody subdivides their property, they have to make a payment into this inclusionary fund for affordable housing. Right, because otherwise they have to provide the, in the past, right. they would That's have right. to provide it. Yeah. So it was meant for in not just fees. general housing, but... Uh, Low market housing. Yeah, right. and, it, and, what, and one of our conclusions, frankly, uh, as well, was that fees in lieu of actual housing doesn't really do us that much good, right? Because we 
we wind up with fees, but people can't live in fees, so we need to house it. So staying with the concept of this is a fund that's been set aside over a number of years, do we know how many years it's taken to uh, for it to reach the five million value? Uh, I don't. I don't. One step. No, we're sort of for those online. We're sort of guessing, speculating that it may have been 2012 or so that we started. Well, my thought was that we might want to try and balance the number of years. Of this. We'll, we will continue to have inclusionary funds collected in the future. Right. Um, and that we might want to balance the funds that we're not spend the whole $5 million that maybe has taken us 18 years or 10 years or something to develop. Uh, that's the next eight year plan. Mm -hmm. Taking 15 or 20 years, maybe we want to spend it over 15 or 20 years, which means some of it in this eight year plan and then the next eight year plan. So there's a continuing, continuing amount of money that we can. Just to, to chirp in, almost all the money I think came from Blue Oaks when we sold the lots there for three and a half or four million dollars plus interest so far. So okay. that was. And that was whatever date that was. So I think that's where most of the money has come from so far. Thank you, David. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and I think Ken brings up a good point about long-term sustainability, but then we do have the, the issue before us right now, which is this uh, singular and hopefully not to be repeated in eight additional years, uh, RENA allocation that we and other rural towns are struggling to meet. Um, you know, uh, what one can look for to the future and hope that the housing pressures are somewhat alleviated by the time of the next arena process or whatever replaces where we are now. So uh, I, for one, would be in favor of trying to get as much affordable housing as soon as we can um, to help make that less of a problem in the future. But um, I don't know how others feel. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I guess we can move to including the public here in a general way that Christina. Oh yeah, yeah, we should use the microphone now. Great idea. I just had a clarifying question. Um, I believe that the funds that were given to the Willow Commons came from the general fund. And so my question is, is that because we didn't have the criteria yet for, the, for using the inclusionary funds? Um, my understanding, the last time I talked to Jeremy about it was that it was dispersed out of the general fund, but it may eventually come out of the inclusionary housing fund. But I don't know if that's been determined yet. Thank you. Sure. Back to the room. Yes, I'm glad you decided that the two committees should talk rather than vote tonight. Um, it kind of seems like sometimes um, some committees don't know what other committees are doing with their subcommittees. So how we can streamline that process to let the others know, because this is super important. <laughs> um, and then I just wanted to clarify a developer would be leasing the Portola Valley land, not giving our land away to a developer. Is that correct? By what you were suggesting with number three? Yeah, I mean, it, it could be either. It could be a land lease. It could be a uh, purchase. It could, uh, yeah. I mean, I think it, that would be up to the town council. Okay. Um, and then I thought of an idea of hiring a real estate person to look for any available land so we don't miss purchasing it ourselves to have the land to. Uh, put low-income housing on. So not only hiring a consultant of a developer, but let's look at what land we can buy when it becomes available because it gets snatched up so quickly. And I think we need to know, number one, where the land is being sold in our town if we need land for affordable housing. Um, and then my fourth point was when you deed restrict, you have a choice of the number of years. So some of the laws are saying 55 years, but you can say 99 years, or you can say in per, perpetuity. So 
you know, what do we want? Do we want it forever? Do we only want it for 55 years? Do we want it for 50? I, you know, if we really want to have it here for the life of this city, of this town, then we need to look at that. And then also it's been raised that the JADUs uh, and the ADUs financing a small amount of money towards those um, so residents can get them up and running. And there's been comment of PG&E, the lines are so much and um, so costly that it prevents them from even fixing it up to rent it out. So I think that is something we definitely have to look into since there's a lot here already. And uh, some people just can't get it up and running as they need to for the state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move online. There's some hands up. And uh, Betsy, we, we haven't heard from you today yet, so we'll start with you. Hi, Betsy. Hi. Thank you, George. And thank you, committee and subcommittee, for the thoughtful work you've put into this. Um, I wanted to begin just with my understanding from what I heard um, your, of your three options. You chose number three based on, on it, its ability to deliver quickly. And I... I first I want to check my understanding because I didn't hear you put up any other qualifications that that caused you to uh, want to subsidize the developers other than that you want to get the money out and to work for the community as quickly as you could. So um, if that's correct, I'll continue. But if I might be wrong, yeah, I don't I don't I don't think that was um, the main rationale. But certainly my understanding was that that's the most probable. We've already had a developer request subsidies. Yeah. As other developers are developing multi-unit houses, they're likely to do that. And so we have the opportunity to maybe steer some of those units into a lower income category than they would be otherwise. Whereas the other two possibilities, um, certainly number one depends on some sort of singularity where we have um, a, a, an unusual opportunity at a large area of property that we could potentially afford to buy, which is unlikely in the town. Uh, number two is predicated on the Dorothy Ford Field project going forward, which is kind of in a sunrise state, I understand it now, still a bit of flux, and therefore trying to use those funds to make it less, um, uh, make it less of a visual impact for everyone, and that's just another idea. But again, that's lower probability than what we think is likely. Which we're already seeing, what, which what is lower probability? I, I, to understand well, lower lower probability to uh, find a big parcel of land. That's number one. Or number oh. two, have Dorothy Ford Field already under development. And the idea is, given we have to do this thing that many people don't want to do, uh, how could we make it as visually unobtrusive as possible by adding some funds to that? Which is why number three looked most promising because it was a deliverable sooner. Well, um, and you can and you can work them in parallel, right? As you're pursuing number three, you spend a little bit at a time as projects come along, and then you still have the opportunity to go for the big one if something happens in that area. I, I'm more or less following your rationale, and I would like to just put forward um, some concern that the project, if as you um, imagine number one is infeasible, and it, I, I haven't heard any um, ideas yet that that caused me to form a different conclusion. Sadly, um, if it's infeasible, and if we are to proceed at that site at anywhere near the density that we're envisioning, um, it will have by far the most visual impact um, upon the town of any of the projects. I hate to see us favor speed when that project we will essentially eliminate because in favoring current developers, and I love Willow Commons, mind you, I I'm a huge fan. I think it's marvelous. And I don't want to discount the import of, of the For Dorothy Ford Park and how um, incredible it would be to underground parking or do other things that will help ameliorate and bring around the community to a big, hard swallow uh, about what's going to happen there. So I'd like to level the playing field in terms of time and extend this 
towards the end of that sunrise period. So we have more confidence that it will be um, that Dorothy uh, Ford Park will be in the play in the field um, for consideration of these funds. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rita, I think you're next. Hi, thank you. I'm in the same situation. So hopefully you can hear me. Uh, Stephen, thank you for projecting uh, your presentation. I could actually hear every word you said. And if the other members of the committee can please speak into the microphones, uh, it would greatly Stephen, help. Stephen thank has you. the radio broadcaster. Yeah, my, yes, my, yes. my kids would understand what you're saying. Okay, so if, if others could move a little closer to the mics or closer to the table, it would be greatly appreciated. I just wanna say the last copy of the, the current draft of the housing element has the same money mentioned, of, you know, like three different ways, spent three different ways. And I'm not sure if this particular committee members, you know, the ones that were on the subgroup uh, have looked at that recently, but um, I, I just strongly suggest that if um, maybe somebody from um, planning can speak with you, uh, speak to the subcommittee about the three different ways that it's named in the current housing element and the different ways that every single dollar of that money has been spent or promised in the housing element that's being sent to HCD, uh, it would probably help with uh, the decisions that this group is making. Thank you. Great, thanks Rita and, and we will talk about that in the meeting we're going to have with the town council subcommittee of the IHF subcommittee here. Um, let's see, David, do you have your hand up? Sure, I, I, I'm impressed. I think you guys have a great plan. Uh, it's not simple to decide how to spend the money. We've had it for over a decade and have spent nothing from it. Um, so the idea of subsidizing developers as plan A if we can get them and they want to do it, I think that's great. Um, if a swan appears white or black and we can buy some property, which we already sold to get the money um, that we can develop on, that would be great. And if somebody comes up with a plan for ADUs that actually would move the needle, that'd be great. So uh, to me, I think whoever is in charge of spending the money has to have a little flexibility and some priorities. And we'll just have to see what happens down the road, but they've got to be able to go forward and see what's best for us any given year. And I think your outline of the priorities is, is a wonderful start. So thanks for doing your work. Thanks. Thank you. Betsy's hand is back up. Yeah, thank you so much for recognizing me again. I'm sorry, I forgot to say that <clears throat> or or I didn't say what I what was on my my mind. Um, the if this were to proceed and we were to eliminate that first um, possibility, well, this would if we if we do not use this money for option number one, there's a zero percent chance that we will not use Dorothy Ford Park. So I hate to close that out at. I think to close out that possibility at this stage of the game and to recommend that that be closed out at this early stage of the game is a signal that is would happen far too soon. I think we need to, in order for the um, sunrise provision to have a chance of bringing this community together, it needs time to work. So in deference to that, um, I would urge us not to proceed at the full speed ahead approach. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, and I would just wanna mention that um, item three doesn't mean that all the funds go out all at once. It's as people are proposing and executing on developments, which will take a considerable amount of time. That's all. So our hope is that we can pursue both. And then, you know, if my dreams came true, number one would come to fruition and we would all pivot in that direction. But um, hope is not a strategy, as we say in business. And um, dreams need money. Very good. So um, I, I think uh, that closes out item E. Uh, the plan going forward is for our subcommittee to meet with the town council subcommittee. And then we'll explore this some more. The town council subcommittee will also meet with the racial equity and diversity uh, racial justice committee. Um, what, what's the exact title of it, Lucy? 
Race and Equity Committee. Race and Equity, thank you. I keep saying it wrong. All right, um, so we will do that. We now have as our final agenda item, uh, the proposal for simplifying and clarifying committee operations. And this is, um, uh, I think colloquially known as the Committee of Committees. And um, we had a meeting uh, just a while ago uh, where another town council subcommittee consisting of Craig Taylor and Sarah Wernickoff uh, called us together, um, just brainstorming on how best and most effectively to structure all of the town's committees. Uh, of course, as we all know, um, a signature of Portola Valley governance is our volunteer committee structure and the fact that there's a lot more participation by residents in town government than in many similarly sized towns, which is a great thing. Uh, but we also are aware of some of the um, uh, bureaucratic requirements of the Brown Act. And um, so the brainstorming here um, on the committee of committees was to think about whether alternative structures for some of our committees would make sense. And as in the handout that was in your packet, um, uh, I'll first mention that they wanted this to be on the agenda for all committees so that we discuss it. And the idea was to solicit input, not to make decisions at this point, but they're very much in sort of information gathering and brainstorming mode. Um, but there's a table uh, and it demonstrates that there are Brown Act committees, which are the way we're all constituted right now. And then they're uh, proposing or thinking about the idea that some committees could be non-Brown Act committees. And the way that would work is they would be a subcommittee, they would be appointed by a subcommittee of the town council, not by the town council itself, which would relieve said committees of some of the requirements relating to the Brown Act. And then there would be something that would be even less uh, controlled, we call it a group. Uh, and that would be open membership, et cetera, et cetera. So for our purposes, from my understanding, looking at this and the finance committee, uh, a group membership doesn't really fit our role here. Uh, the key thing for us to think about um, would be whether we wish to remain a Brown Act committee or whether we might consider a non-Brown Act committee sort of designation. Um, in essence, my understanding of, of the non-Brown Act uh, designation is that not much would change functionally the way this committee works with the um, sole thing that we might operate a bit more informally as frankly we did in, in years past um, where there was just a little more flexibility on agenda setting um, and some of the communications, uh, there, there still would need be noticing of meetings and transparency and all the rest. Uh, but it would, for, for instance, allow the potential for committee members to participate virtually as well. So if you were on a business trip and you could meet from a hotel room, you could do that rather than we all have to physically be here. And, um, you know, uh, personally, given I've just run into my business travel schedule in Europe, blowing up my um, uh, schedule for late May, which I already told you about earlier, that would be a real benefit uh, since that would make it easier to do the meeting from the from, from hours away. Sure, why not? Just Stay up. Start just, in the morning. Just, just jet lag yourself one day rather than take a trip. It's always preferable. Anyway, so um, you, you, with, with that by way of an you know, introduction, I'd love to just solicit opinions from everyone here in terms of whether you think this idea has merit um, whether we might fit into one of these bins or whether you think we should just continue the way we are, just get a sense from everyone on what you think. Uh, George, in, in my opinion, it's a step in the right direction. It's one of the questions that I asked. It is a step in the right direction. Um, and it's, I, I liken it a lot to, um, the way we dealt with the financial disclosure requirements that this committee uh, objected to a couple of years ago. And uh, we resolved that by saying we just won't um, recommend any specific actions. Um, and that way um, we made it less burdensome. And I think that being a non-Brown Act committee would, would be useful. Anyone else? Well, I certainly agree. Any less 
um, would be welcome. I guess minutes would still be required. <laughs> oh yeah, we would still uh, keep do that. Um, would that mean we could send emails and respond to them? Do you know, um, I would have to solicit advice to make sure that that was the case. I, I think because that's all brown. I think right? we would be able to. Yeah, there, there wouldn't be a reason. But of course, um, the, the only reason why I emphasize that we would keep things as they are, we wouldn't want to transact substantive business because we never did that in the past anyway. We wanted to have meetings of the committee. But the point is, if three of us, you know, copied one another on a message, it would no longer potentially be a, a violation of law. Uh, and so right now, for example, when I send you scheduling messages, I tend to put it all, you all on one carbon copy so no one accidentally hits reply all and, you know, you run into some of these, um, these things that are, I think, aimed at a different level of government decision making. I, I would appreciate, and maybe it's not quite allowed, email discussion. I guess I'm, I'm used to that. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah. yeah, well, uh, again, I, how much would be allowed? Yeah, and I'm not sure, uh, Judith, do you have a sense on maybe our town council liaison can comment on that? My, my understanding is we'd be relieved of some of the legal responsibilities and then how we choose to operate would be determined by the town council. Yeah, I think there are some, as you go into that chart, you should look at each and every line and you know each of those, to my knowledge, is up for discussion. Mm -hmm. um, the Brown Act in general is, you know, directed to preserving public visibility so that, you know, important decisions get a formal process. You do have as a Brown Act com committee, subcommittees that are not a quorum that you can have more fulsome discussions. But if you are not a Brown Act committee and you're emailing, um, that in theory should be allowed if the town council thinks that that's the operational direction they want to go. So if you have a view on that, um, discuss it and, and let us know. Maybe we could add that to the table. It's not email. Yeah, it's not, a, I, I don't know that it's really on there. It's a little bit implicit, but um, yeah, that would be a good point to add. Yeah, Thank you. That's, great. Well, that's, that's the most, Irritating to me. I mean, well, yeah, this, yeah, having to watch. To to and, mm -hmm. No offense to people out there, but it was so nice when we used to meet in the conference room. Um, and it was just. What what time um, frame was that? Before, before COVID. Okay. No one cared about our meetings. No one showed up. <laughs> Hi, can you speak into the mic? Have to speak into the microphone. The pre, uh, <laughs> our pre-COVID meetings. We're we're rhapsodizing about the good old days. Yeah, sorry, you guys out there. But but I'll take that back. First meeting in person, so we're just not used to it. It's part of it's. I'll I'm take that back as a point that they need to consider more expressly in the chart. Yeah. Okay. And and I I take that. I appreciate that. So. Um, what I'm hearing, and, and I, I'm going to state it this way in case someone objects, because I'd love to hear the debate, is that uh, moving in a non-Brown Act committee direction would be good for us. We would support that. And an open question is, what would the guidance be on substantive communications uh, offline out of the setting of meetings, say, via email and that kind of thing? What are the appropriate limits on that that the town council would want to establish? for these non-Brown Act committees that would be established by a subcommittee of the town council and, and hence they have that status. And I, I think we're having a follow-up meeting on this uh, soon, actually another, and I, and I can bring that in, there's a, um, a very substantive thing to think about because a certain amount of communication is good, um, too much wouldn't be good because they're the people who are showing up at this meeting and also online listening to this meeting. Uh, who'd want to know what's going on. So that's all very appropriate. But then there are other benefits where, again, if some of us were on the road, uh, we could zoom in from our hotel room and be part of the meeting rather than, well, we miss quorum and you know our schedules get all messed up because uh, people have to earn a living and, and it makes it very hard to be here in person for every single meeting that's scheduled months in advance. 
Okay. Um, further conversation on this here? Yes. So, so George, um, question for you. Is it, does it make sense to think about um, I think sort of a hybrid approach? Um, when I think about this committee, this committee does a lot of things that I, I don't think are of the details of which are not of much interest to the general public. I don't think they lose very much by not seeing how the sausage is made. What they really care about, I think, I would care about um, if I wasn't on this committee, are the big ticket recommendations that we make on, on the budget, on tax policy. Um, there's, a, there's a small handful of big issues, some of which we deal with every year, some of which you know pop up. Um, do we need to have total transparency, the Brand Act stuff on um, how we negotiate with the, the sheriff's contract? I, I don't know. That's kind of more of a town council issue. Again, I, I think what people care in the end is what's the total amount of money being spent, how much are we bringing in? Uh, do, do people want to look in on the details of reviewing stuff with the auditors? What they really care about is did we spend the money properly in compliance with the law and was every dollar accounted for and in the right fund? I mean, you know, so there, there may be a series. So when I, I guess what I'm getting to, there may be a series of topics or issues that we have, we should always handle at the full scale Brown Act level, but a lot of other uh, issues that don't rise to that level, it'd be easier to work on more collegial, three or four people can get together and talk about it. I, I don't know if that's something that, that would appeal to other committees as well, but I think a lot of us you know, have a 2080 thing, 20% of the stuff we work on is the most important stuff the public cares about, and the other 80% is stuff we have to do to run a, you know, a, a town. Yeah, I, th I think one, um, one way the current proposal would encapsulate some of what you're saying is just the agenda flexibility where you would be able to just mix and match. We wouldn't have this formal setting where you can only bring up certain things that have been noticed. And in other words, we could cover an extra issue right now that we call that mm -hmm. uh, in the minor category. Other stuff from the committee? Comments from the floor or the on online community? Oh, yes, Christine. Oh, Caroline, I'm sorry. I knew it started with C. No, that's okay. Thank you. Um, I think Mr. Urban made a very good point. Um, and, and remember, we had a different budget five years ago. We started coming to your committee because we have concerns. Um, there's also, I believe, with the previous town council, some authority, and I think more authority was given to the town manager and we did not know where these funds went. And then we, as the residents, brought up major concerns, as Christy said earlier, you know, we have so many issues with our infrastructure and nothing gets done. Um, we're very concerned to the older population, the non-working population, where will they get the funds to upgrade their housing? Um, there's so many issues in this town, and that's why um, we are volunteers. We like to work with several committees, but we feel there was also a loss of communication among the communities, and people did not know exactly what was going on. So if we can have more collaborative effort among all the committees, so all the issues are up front, and we can all work to resolving our budget and resolving all the issues that are going on. Thank you. I think that's um, some really good points. Um, and, and indeed, part, part of what a non-Brown Act structure could help is all of us communicate better. I suppose I was talking about what, the one reason nobody knows what anyone else is doing is because there are very formal processes that make, make it Difficult, if not impossible, to informally just check in and find out what's going on. So that's, that's a good point. Um, if there's no objection, what I'll do is I'll take this back to the next uh, committee of committees meeting. You know, I think it's in a couple of weeks. It's sometime in May, and and I may have to ask one of you to go in my place because I think I'm in Europe. 
Um, are you attending that anymore? Oh, good. You may, you may be able to, to <laughs> carry, <laughs> carry you, may, you may be able to double dip for us then. Uh, and that would be great. But if you could uh, carry forward and, and I'll communicate with you on this, but um, these items here that have been discussed about what are the communications are. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so what I took out of that comment is uh, um, as, as something to bring back is who makes the decision of who's on what committee. And, and you also think certain committees are required are required um, to be. Isn't it something about what's in the town charter or some sort of document? I don't know all of them on the top of my head, but I'll give you an example, like the traffic committee, the BBTS committee. It's written, there are some duties written in the municipal code that they have to do. So that, that is the issue. Yes, yeah, so if, they, if they're doing something official legally. Yeah, I don't know that we fall in that group. So. Yeah, the budget or the audit. But we don't, all we do is recommend. Yeah, we don't, we don't make any decisions. Don't make any decisions. And I thought that was the difference where some of the traffic county 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 make decisions. Make decisions. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, that's that's interesting. So, um, do do I have comments from online or some? Caroline, did you have your hand up? No, you didn't. Okay. Um, all right. So this is interesting. We we're going to have um, communication back on exactly what this means and try to figure out um, what the limits are in terms of communications. Further comments? Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Yes, I knew I was blanking on something. Um, yeah, for the commissions and the town council up until February, we had uh, fulsome minutes, um, play by play, like not every single um and awe, but it was, you know, Christy Corley stood up and had a comment on X and that would go into the minutes. They have gone to action minutes now, which reflect that Christy spoke, but not what she said. And similarly, it would not have details of three members of the committee thought X and the rest thought Y. It would just say a vote was taken. Here's the outcome and um, and no context around it. So in order to get that context, you'd probably have to go back and listen to the, the video if it's a commission or or the town council. But for committees, um, you know, I don't you have to look back at what you found helpful in your role as a committee member. Do you ever go back and look at those? If not, maybe keeping it simple is better. Anytime you want fulsome minutes, 
you're adding to staff burden and cost. So there's a balance, right? You just want to, and that's why it's important for you to have a view. Or if you don't have a strong view, that's okay. But we, we'd like to understand that. How, how do you decision. distinguish between action and summary? Uh, what are the three categories? Verbatim, action, and summary. And verbatim sounds like that's just what you described. Yeah. Action, you know, you also described I it summary. I suspect summary, and I don't know what was intended. Um, I suspect that means the following topics were discussed at the meeting. Like, I think that's because it's in the third column, right? Yeah. I would imagine it's just a very casual, these, these topics were discussed without who said who who spoke at the meeting and what actions were specifically taken does that sound right okay i'd not heard of those before but new new territory for us well i, I certainly think verbatim minutes are over the top so mm -hmm. i mean um, sometimes i get close just because mm -hmm. i I, I, I write, well, I just write minutes and uh, figured more is always better. Um, uh, I, I'm a supporter of action. That gets to the key topics that were discussed and what we did about it. And if you want to watch it, you can watch it on YouTube. Yes, Caroline. Oh, so there's a hyperlink to the recording with the minute. That's a, that's a cool idea. Um, can, can we take a note of that? That is a neat idea. Thank you. Okay. Does, does everyone agree that action minutes sound like a good idea for us? Or? I didn't used to think so. Um, I remember we had a discussion some years back on the same topic, I, although I don't think it came to the committee. I think um, we were just asked individually. And um, I found that as a committee member, action minutes didn't give me enough information or a sense of you know what the issues were and what the conflicts were and where the compromises were and what the alternatives were discussed. I didn't learn anything um, from that that couldn't be, you know, published in a, in a website or something. Um, the, the summary minutes, the way we used to, the way they were written from the last meeting, for example, um, is what I think of as summary minutes, where you get some context of the issue, who may include what people said, what they felt about, um, who had a different point of view, and then the vote was taken, we had this result. It's a good historical record if you're a committee member to have that and be able to go back and see how people felt about things. Without that, just based on action, what we voted on, you could have a very short you know, summary with no way to get a historical perspective. So, mm -hmm. um, now of course, when I'm the one who's having to take the minutes, I always favor the action minutes, right? Because it's easier. It's, it's, there's no question it's a lot of work to you know, to do it manually or on your computer, um, but it makes it much more valuable, I think, to all the other uh, committee members, uh, or at least for this committee, it may not be true of other committees. Yes, there. Um, so, so what I'm hearing, um, and love to hear more from people, of course, but what I've heard so far is verbatim sounds out. We can always do it. And what we're sort of, uh, arguing the merits of is between action, which is very efficient, but as Bill just pointed out, lacks the context that we used to in summary. Yes. yes. Uh, I, I see that you, you want to have input, um, and, but I just do want to point out that even summary minutes don't have every person. Some, sometimes several people who make similar comments get 
concatenated into members of the public, including the following and this was discussed. But but it gives a flavor. This is not a transcript. Okay. Other comments? Right. Anyone online? Anyone in the room? Any other business? Well, that's on the agenda. The I one the one other business I would mention is that at previous meetings we talked about um, doing a revenue generation brainstorm. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we've quite done that yet or focused on that. And in light of what we've heard today, that seems like a good idea to bring to a future agenda. And maybe just as individual committee members tutoring about our days, we could sort of keep it in mind. Yes, and um, thank you for that, Lucy. Um, that was part of, of the original agenda for this meeting before Jeremy and I started the saving. And then right. that's why we put it up. But we will get back to that. and. Uh, even, even if we wanted to not get back to that, we're gonna to have to get back to that, yeah. right? Given what the sheriff's department is bringing on. So, all right, with that, uh, with nothing else, uh, we'll call the meeting adjourned at uh, 5.11. So thank you everyone.